we have a little bit less time available to us this evening, so we're not going to do what we did on Sunday. Uh, we'll contract ourselves just to review one hymn and uh, take a look at uh, a second one where the words are new, but the tune is very familiar to us. <clears throat> uh, just a quick reminder again, we want to uh, realize how important it is um, that we have sung worship in the church. We don't want to just do it because we get to that part in the order of service and there's a hymn number there, um, and so we stand and sing it without even thinking about it. It is very important um, as a means by which we can praise and glorify God, express the love of our hearts for Him, um, and also a means by which we can teach and admonish one another um, as we take these words on our hearts and in our minds and we express them with our lips we are teaching um, one another as we sing and we want to expand the number of hymns that we actually have available to us um, because it's always good to have as many good hymns as we can uh, to choose from. Uh, remember Wesley's instructions, learn the tunes, sing them exactly as they are printed, that's the words. All of us should be engaged in singing worship to the Lord. Uh, we should not sing like we're half dead. Uh, but on the other hand, neither should we sing like we just had half a gallon of strong coffee. Um, bouncing off the ceiling and bawling our heads off because that doesn't honor God either. Uh, we should sing in time, not rush on ahead of the accompaniment nor lag behind it. Uh, but above all these things, we need to have an eye to the Lord um, because he certainly has an eye to us as we are worshiping him. And it's what is on our hearts that uh, that he is concerned with. It doesn't matter what we do outwardly. If, uh, if there is no corresponding emotion or desire or, um, or love in our hearts for the Lord, then that's not worship and that uh, won't be pleasing to him. So we must sing spiritually. Now, um, we're going to review this one. It's number 182 in your hymn books. And uh, I picked this in all innocence uh, when I was preaching a couple of weeks ago, and it became apparent about halfway through the first hymn, that it, uh, first verse, that it wasn't a hymn that we were terribly familiar with. Um, but it is, um, I think, a very useful hymn. Um, you can tell from the title what it is about. And um, so we will uh, sing this hymn as we begin. And uh, if I could ask, Kathy, is it uh, you'll be playing? If you could play the verse through for us so we can hear the tune again. And then we'll stand and sing this hymn together. All about our Savior's love to us and the condition that we were in um, when he loved us and when he died for us. So uh, let's hear the, the music. Stand and sing.
Please be seated. Um, we were looking, of course, at the theme of friend of sinners uh, when we sang that hymn on that Sunday morning, and that certainly comes through there, as does one of the themes from this last Sunday morning's message about the willingness with which Christ uh, went to the cross uh, and the protection, of course, that he gave to his disciples in the process, which is it's interesting that the two hymns we're singing tonight should have a reference to the willingness of Christ going to the cross on the one hand and uh, to the protection of our God for his people on the other. It's a kind of an echo of uh, Sunday morning's sermon. Uh, so this is a hymn, the one we're going to learn tonight, by uh, Augustus Montague Top Lady. Um, it's a great name. Um, I'm not sure uh, how it was regarded back in those days, but it does sound a little bit uh, peculiar today. But we will know him uh, if we were here two years ago for the Reformation Lecture Series. And, uh, or if not, uh, you can go on the website and, and pick this up. It, he was one of the characters that uh, we looked at as we considered the Reformation in England. And uh, so we'll do a quick review of the man. Uh, before we get to the hymn, um, but as before, there is a pretty extensive biography of him, uh, the speaking notes for that message back in October of 2011. But he was born in Farnham in Surrey in the UK on November the 4th of 1740, uh, subsequently converted uh, August of 1756, and uh, there appears to have been a, a fairly undocumented part of his life um, because he was then ordained uh, into uh, the Church of England, I believe, in 1762. He was a man of fairly weak constitution. He suffered uh, from consumption, a uh, condition of the lungs, which uh, ultimately killed him. Uh, he began his ministry, um, which lasted 16 years, I believe, in Devon, in the west part of England. Um, and then I think a doctor advised him that it would be much better for his health to go and enjoy uh, the smog and uh, smoke and other stuff in London, which is obviously a, a great cure for the lungs. Yeah. Stop and think about it. I, I hope his doctor had malpractice insurance. Anyway, he went there, and uh, in the providence of God, I think those were probably the most useful years of his ministry, and he was really in a much better environment uh, there amongst evangelicals and, and ministering faithfully than, um, and much more appreciated than when he was in this rather rural um, environment in Devon. Um, amongst his uh, gifts and contributions, uh, he was a preacher. Um, a few of his sermons have survived. A writer and uh, a controversialist. Um, I was going to say a great controversialist. Um, and in one sense he was. Uh, you'll remember that he, I think the right phrase would be uh, railed against John Wesley. Um, he was rightly consumed with a passion for the glory of God. And he believed that the doctrine that John Wesley and uh, the Wesleyan Methodists were propagating, because it gave a part of the process of salvation into the hands of man and took it therefore away from God's sovereignty. Uh, that robbed God of the glory that was rightfully his in the salvation of the souls of men. And uh, that was, uh, and you have to admire his um, zeal. Uh, it was more than he could bear to see the glory of his God being uh, 
treated in that way. And uh, it was also, I think, uh, pretty much um, a characteristic of the day not to necessarily be as polite as we would be today um, when you are expressing a disagreement with somebody in writing. And he certainly gave full vent to, uh, to his feelings. Um, there was one, uh, if, you, if you pull down those speaking notes, I remember uh, Pastor Bryant found one quote where uh, uh, Top Lady basically said that Wesley's treatment of a subject was like a, a fumbling anatomist and he was pretty useless. Uh, so he didn't have a lot of time for Wesley and his uh, teaching. In fact, he even essentially got off his deathbed to go in front of his congregation to quash a rumor that he, he was repenting or recanting of some of the things that he had said against John Wesley. And uh, he said, not true at all. He wouldn't take back one word of it. Anyway, above all of his gifts, he ex certainly excelled in the gift of writing hymns. And uh, we know many of these. They are favorites of ours. I think Rock of Ages, Holy Ghost, Dispel Our Sadness, um, A Debtor to Mercy Alone. Um, and it's always been a, a source of disappointment to me that since a sovereign protector I have is set to exactly the same tune and it has exactly the same number of verses and is full of wonderful truth, as we are about to see, um, that the compilers of the Trinity hymnal didn't see fit to include it. So uh, we're going to rectify that tonight. Anyway, uh, Top Lady subsequently uh, went to be with the Lord, uh, August the 11th. 1778 at the age of 37 years uh, but like so many people uh, of the era um, and, and the godly uh, in the world he probably accomplished more in that short life than, than many today do in lives that are twice as long or even more So let's uh, take a look at this uh, wonderful hymn. Um, what is it about? Excellent. It was, it was not a trick question. It was <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. A sovereign protector. Um, who is the sovereign protector that top lady has in mind. Jesus and, and, and God the Father, it could be either, that's, that's not clear at the moment. <clears throat> but, I mean, he's a protector. Um, is that good to know that he is a protector? Is it enough to know that he's a protector? Could top lady have written, a protector I have? It wouldn't have scanned as well, but I'm thinking, we've, I don't know if you, some of you will have seen, we have a new kitten at home. Um, would, should I be comfortable if that kitten was my protector? Would I be more comfortable with a lion or with a kitten if uh, some people broke into the house one night? What would I rather have for protection? Okay, so is it enough just to say I have a protector? Uh, no, it isn't, but we don't have just a protector. We have a sovereign protector. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark, um, a wall of defense. Um, and there are literally dozens of scriptures that you could find that talk about how God protects, defends, cares for his people and will not allow harm uh, to come to them. So that's what it's about. Uh, by the way, this first verse, just see how many of the attributes of God you can count 
in the space of eight lines. Shout, shout some of them out. Sovereign. Protector, unchangeable. Invisible. Faithful, omnipresent. Gracious. Almighty, yes. Uh, uh, that's pretty impressive. I, I challenge you to fit as many attributes of, as that into eight lines of a hymn stanza and have it make sense. And have it scan and have it <laughs> fit uh, to a tune. Anyway, he is unseen. As uh, Paul says to Timothy, he alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. But although he's unseen, uh, supposing he was a protector uh, who was not um, forever at hand, would that be good? Supposing he was somewhere around the other side of the world when you got into trouble, and uh, that wouldn't be quite so good. So all of these things you have to relate back to this idea of him being a protector uh, and see how it qualifies him so wonderfully for that role. Again, uh, many, many scriptures um, that you could turn to. There's one that I didn't have time to turn up but about, am I a God who is near and oh, far off and not a God who is near or something like that. And then Psalm 139, I could not have fitted that onto a single slide, but it, the psalm writer lists all the places where he could think of that he could go. And he says, but even if I went there, you would be there. If I crossed the ocean and, and went to the other side of the, of the sea, you would be there. If I go into the depths, you are there. Um, he is forever at hand. Unchangeable. Is that good to know in a protector? Um, it wouldn't be that great if, uh, as a protector, he could change his mind. Well, I don't want to be a protector today. <clears throat> every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Do you know what... Um, James is referring to there. Think of something that most days here we actually get to see, and every time we see it, it's the same. It never changes. The sun. Um, but there is one thing about the sun that changes every day, according to James anyway. We, uh, this, yes, on, come in here on Sunday evening, what's happening at the beginning across the screen? And you can actually see that shaft of sunlight moving up the screen, if you look closely enough, as the sun sets. So even that really constant um, thing is, from our perspective, because of the movement of the earth, there's, there's change with it. Well, not so with our God. Um, there's no variation with him and no shifting shadow. Uh, and he's faithful. Is that good to have in a protector? Why, why is that? Supposing you had an unfaithful protector. What would... Right. He might protect you one day and then sort of say you're on your own the next the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. <clears throat> and as a protector, it's quite important what he actually is protecting us for, isn't it? He is faithful to save. He's unchangeable in his determination to save his children. Um, that is 
what he decides to do, and that is what his protection is afforded to us in order to bring about infallibly that we will be saved, that he will not lose any of those for whom he sent Christ into this world. Um, all right, almighty to rule and command. Is that good to have in a protector? If, uh, if it wasn't, you may as well have the little kitten. Um, what is there that God is not in control of? Nothing. Uh, everything is subject to his command. Everything obeys his voice, the word of his power. Think how the whole creation just leapt into being in an instant at a word from God. And that did not tax him to do that. Um, that was, well, I don't think easy or difficult really have any real meaning in relation to God because nothing is too hard for him. So here is this protector, always close by, never changing, never altering in his determination to save us, and he has all the power at his disposal um, in order to bring that about. He rules by his might forever. His eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Okay, now, um, he smiles and my comforts abound. Does that mean that when he smiles, a really nice uh, queen-size bed with a super mattress appears, or maybe three of them because it's abundant comfort? What do we think? Is that, is that what this means? Uh, a pastor that we had back in England, there was a, um, a fabric softener called Comfort back in England. I don't think that brand ever made its way over here. And the little advertising jingle for it was softness is a thing called comfort. And whenever he would preach on a verse about the comfort of God for his people, he would say, it is not softness, it's backbone, it's strength. That's God's comfort for his people. So he smiles at us, he has this determination uh, to save us, he uh, extends his protection to us, he has all the power that he needs, and he smiles upon us. And uh, in his smiling upon us, he gives us everything that we need, all the strength and all of the grace is ours uh, so that we will be saved. His grace as the dew shall descend. What is his grace? What is that often shorthand for? When, when we talk about the means of grace, the Holy Spirit, the influence of the Holy Spirit. And what is due? Is that uh, sometimes an emblem for uh, the Holy Spirit, that, that kind of sprinkling of water, as it were? But what, what, what else does due do? There's a couple of verses here that'll help us to think about this. It refreshes. Yeah, it, um, it uh, moistens. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. And then uh, the king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. You've seen these photographs of little droplets of dew on a leaf or on a flower with the sunlight catching them, and it's beautiful. It's glorious. Um, the grace of God coming down upon his children. And uh, walls of salvation surrounding the soul he delights to defend. 
violence will not be heard again in your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. So that's our defense. Um, it's God's determination to save us. It's the power that he has. It's the, the faithfulness, the unchangeableness um, that makes him our sovereign protector if we've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we wanted to sum up this first verse, what's, uh, what kind of a phrase might we use to sum up the content? What's it about? Okay, yeah. Who my protector is. Okay, he, he begins by saying that, that, uh, that he has one, and, and all true Christians do. But then he says, what, what a protector. Um, lists out you know, a good number of the attributes of God there in, in just a few lines. That is the one who is concerned about every child he has. Um, and that should be a tremendous encouragement to us. So let's move on to the second uh, verse. Inspirer and hearer of prayer. Um, there's a lot of things like this in the Christian life because we're so weak and useless. We, we are dead apart from the action of his Holy Spirit. Um, it's like he gives us the gift of faith. And then we exercise that faith and put it in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he rewards us because we've exercised the faith that he just gave us. Well, here's another one. He is the one who inspires our prayers. We are to pray in the Spirit. The Spirit comes upon us. He works up within us and brings to our mind the things we need to pray for, lays them as burdens on our heart. And then we give utterance to them or we pray them quietly in our, in our hearts. And he hears them. That's remarkable, isn't it? It's good to know when we're, we're just about to go to the back and, and have a prayer time. Uh, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous, having, of course, first made them righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shepherd and guardian of thine, you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian, uh, which is another uh, translation for overseer or bishop, um, of your souls, elder. So here is uh, God as our shepherd. Uh, you know what a shepherd does. He feeds, he protects, he guides, he uses the rod and the staff as we were thinking about the other night. Um, he goes out after the ones that are straying away. He um, defends them against wolves and, and so on and so forth. All those wonderful images and he does that for every single one that he calls his child. Um, why did Top Lady put in this piece about covenant care. Does that make a difference, that it's covenant care? Okay. It, a covenant is, is a binding agreement. God, has, God did not have to do this. Of course, it would be enough if he said, I'm going to do it. But he's actually, for our sakes, entered into this agreement so that we can know beyond all doubt. He took a he made a promise and he took an oath, as the writer to the Hebrews says, so that we who have fled to take refuge in him might know beyond all doubt that he is determined uh, to save us. Um, there's what he said to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. Uh, who are the descendants there? Who are the Israelites today? The elect, yeah, it's us. That's if you're a Christian tonight, then oops, wrong button. <laughs> Let's try that again. 
Right. That is you. You are a child of Abraham, a descendant um, according to this promise. To be a God to you, it's an everlasting covenant, to be a God to you and to your descendants after you. I sleeping and waking resign. Um, We're going to get to a little bit more about this in a moment, but it's kind of a consequence, isn't it? If you if you understand who it is who's protecting you and what power he has at his disposal and his heart of love towards you and all that he has done to make sure that it is not remotely possible that you could fall away or lose the salvation that he purchased for you. Um, no wonder the psalmist says, "In peace I will both lie down and sleep for you." Alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. If he's our protector, um, we should sleep like babes, as they say, every night. Um, We shouldn't be disturbed by the things that afflict the world, the anxiety, um, and so on and so forth. If thou art my shield and my sun... For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. What does a shield do? Protects. And what does a sun do? What does the sun do? Keeps us alive. Gives us light and heat. Um, And that's... He's saying, now, if that's true, if, if that, and the Scripture says that's true, God says that of himself in relation to us, now, that he's not going to withhold anything good from us. He gives us grace and he gives us glory. Then the night is no darkness to me. What do you think he's talking about here? Right. Curiously enough, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. In the light of the last two lines, though, I think he may not be talking about the literal night here. I think he may have death in mind. And death has no darkness for the Christian because no matter how fast our moments roll on, and this week they're rolling on faster than ever for, uh, for me and one or two others I've been speaking to, it doesn't matter how fast they're going. We don't, have to get, we don't have to panic because our life here is running out and we have no hope. It doesn't matter, you know, no matter how fast days come and go, the net result is, you know, we are a, a what's the, that phrase, a day's march nearer home. You know, every, every night when we lay our head on the pillow, that's one more day on the path uh, to glory. Uh, the night, you know, death has no sting for the Christian. Uh, the sting has been taken out. Uh, top lady died uh, a, a quite exemplary death, apart from getting out to... Uh, to go and speak to the church about Wesley. Um, He died in much peace and with much joy and and consolation. So what's the summary for this verse? The first is the protector that I have and what a protector he is. What's this verse? it's, It's part of the response, but it's the response that applies to me when. Where am I while all of this is happening? here we are I can live in peace here if, if, if that's the protector that I have then I can live in peace while I'm here everybody agree with that is, it, is that true what should disturb the believer's peace here on earth Nothing, but sadly, we allow many things to do so. Because I think we take our eyes off the protector that we have. 
Okay, the last verse. This one's much simpler um, because it basically repeats something we looked at on Sunday evening. <coughs> kind author. Here, here it is again, by the way. He is the author. He wrote the book about the inheritance that we would have in glory. And then he made himself the foundation for it. You know, that he is the basis on which we have a hope of glory in heaven. So he wrote it, and then he makes himself the guarantor and the foundation for the hope of heaven that every true believer has. So what does he do? He says, thee, thee for my God I avow, I, I confirm, I swear it, that you are my God, and you have taken me to yourself, and I wouldn't want another. My glad Ebenezer set up. What's an Ebenezer? Yeah, stone of help. And own thou hast helped me till now. Is this starting to sound a little bit like one of the verses from uh, Sunday evening? I won't read this, but uh, we had this Sunday evening exactly. Samuel taking the stone and saying, the Lord has helped us to this point. And every time he helps us, we can raise up a, a, a stone of help. And then we can look back down our lives and we can see all those stones of help. Um, and that's what he's going to do here, just like the, the hymn writer on, on Sunday evening. I muse on the years that are past, wherein my defense thou hast proved, nor wilt thou relinquish at last a sinner so signally loved. And again, I'm confident that he who has begun a good work in us will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So what would the summary for this verse be? Yeah, I have a protector now. I can live in peace here. Uh, and there may be other ways to summarize this. Um, but my future is very secure. And I can look back and draw encouragement that that is true from everything that I've already seen. Um, I can look into the future with great hope and with great joy. So let's close off this section of the study. If you want to see the music, it's number 463 in the hymn book. But let's stand and sing a sovereign protector I have.
Okay, let's pray, and then uh, we'll move to the back for our prayer meeting.